Hi, I'm Michael, and welcome to Beyond the Screenplay, the podcast where each week we do a conversational deep dive analysis into a film. Today we're talking about two films, Forrest Gump, directed by Robert Zemeckis, and The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, directed by David Fincher, both of which were written by Eric Roth. I'm joined today by part of the Beyond the Screenplay team, Trisha Aran. Hello, everyone. And Brian Bittner. Hello, hello. And we are joined once again by none other than video essayist, filmmaker, Patrick Willems. Thank you. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me once again. It's a pleasure to be back. So I'm excited because this is kind of a a continuation of a conversation (laughs) because when we recorded recently our Paddington episode, after we were done recording, we were just chatting and somehow the idea of talking about The Curious Case of Benjamin Button and Forrest Gump came up and we spent a fair amount of time talking about how weird they are and how weirdly (laughs) similar they are, but also just unto themselves how weird they were. And so we kind of came away from that being like, I think this could be a fun episode. We should just talk about these two movies and see what happens. And so here we are. Um, So I'm excited to get into these two movies really quick. The question for people listening on the Spotify app is what other movie mashups do you want to see us do in a future episode? Because this is the first time we're talking about two films and comparing them like this. Okay, so to just kind of start, like Patrick, I just want to get your first like hit. Like what is what do you make of these movies like, what comes to your mind when you think of these two movies? So I've been thinking about this particular topic for over a year now. In early 2020, uh, I made this long video about the entire filmography of Robert Zemeckis. And it was when I was rewatching Forrest Gump for the first time, I think, since I was in high school. It really was hitting me how deeply strange that movie is. <laughs> mm-hmm. And also, and especially like, it's a strange movie. What makes it stranger is that it is one of the most popular movies ever made. Mm -hmm. It was the Mm -hmm. highest grossing film of 1994 and then won the Best Picture Oscar. Like it is like a like this like beloved artifact of 20th century cinema. And it's very strange. And I was also thinking about how strange it is that then like 14 years later, the same writer wrote a very similar movie. And what's (laughs) okay? I'm going to start with like this is what I think is especially strange. These are both adaptations of existing works. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. The novel Forrest Gump and then the F. Scott Fitzgerald short story, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. And both of these are, are pretty different from their source material. The, the, the novel Forrest Gump is like full satire, much darker. Uh, it, it, not, not the heartwarming inspirational story <laughs> that the movie is. And then the curious case of Benjamin Button is like a, a, a just a bizarre little short story where he's like he's born as a full grown adult. And so, but the idea that that the same writer would look at both of these texts and say, "But what if they were <laughs> they were stories about a man from the South who lived through many of the major events of the 20th century mm-hmm. uh, had this." strange uh, ongoing relationship with a a woman he met when they were both children, fought in wars, Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. had a child that he uh, was estranged from for much of their life. Lived in a big house (laughs) with his mama, (laughs) who, of course, like passes at the crisis point of the movie. A house where people are Always coming and going. Always coming and going. Yeah, it's a frame story, so it's being told to you as a a Mm -hmm. story, as like the story itself is in present day. Yes. It's this like unusually naive boy who gets into all these like adventures and stuff and like just doesn't quite understand how the world works. Yeah. There's all of this stuff. And so when I was working on this video back in January 2020, I think there's a little part in the video where I just go on like a little side tangent about how weirdly similar these two movies are. I'm like, and maybe one day someone should make a video about that. I don't have time to do it now, but someone should do it. I have not done that, but now here we're doing a podcast about it. So this is, this is better. And thank God. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's high time. Yeah. Well, and so there are so many things that we can talk about. It's also interesting, you know, there are similarities about like all the different beats that happen in these movies, but also like you were mentioning there, Brian, like the framing of them, like they're both love stories. They're both like biopics about fictional people Mm -hmm. and structured in that way. They're both just kind of weird anomalies 
like a weird way to do a movie or like a, a a story about a person to like make this kind of fake biopic and then have them both be really weird. I think what's interesting about the differences in them is that, uh, you know, Forrest Gump is much more whimsical and kind of knows it's a kind of a, uh-huh. a silly right. st- story. There's like fun yep. to it. And curious case that Benjamin Button is very much not. It is lacking in silliness, I would say, comparatively anyway. And it's kind of the weirder of the two to take such a realistic, stylistic point of view about it. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is this was my exact thought when I was watching them this time, which is at least Forrest Gump knows it's goofy. Like it knows it's goofy and there's this very strong tonal contrast, especially when you watch them back to back, where Benjamin Button takes itself incredibly seriously for being the absolutely less realistic, like straight magic. It's just magic right. of the two, right? Sorry to pit them head to head so quickly in this episode, but <laughs> let's get into it. Well, I mean, we might as well, right? Like, this is why Benjamin Button, I think, ultimately doesn't work for a lot of people, whereas Forrest Gump kind of does, if the accolades and box office receipts are any measure, and enduring popularity, I would say, are any measure. Setting aside for now the Forrest Gump is bad camp, because they, they've <laughs> always been there. Mm-hmm. Um, right. They exist. But I think you know Forrest Gump, as you're pointing out, Patrick, is this really beloved movie And Benjamin Button is kind of this weird outlier in David Fincher's filmography among Fincher fanboys. And mostly that's all Benjamin Button is in terms of cinematic impact. Wasn't Benjamin Button fairly successful when it came out? Like, I'm pretty sure it got like a Best Picture nomination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think it did okay, but I think it also... But I mean, it it was not like a... Forrest Gump level phenomenon. No. It was ever going to be like... No. Right. It's not, you know... Again, it hits similar beats, except it is not going for like the sort of tear jerking inspirational moments that, you know, that Forrest Gump is. It's funny because this is kind of like Fincher has made a lot of very popular, successful movies. Mm -hmm. But this is this is, Trisha, as you said, an outlier in his filmography. And this is kind of like the closest he's come to making kind of a straight down the middle like kind of like broadly appealing like movie like a movie mm-hmm. you could take the whole family to right Th- this is the closest to that <laughs> but but that, but it's a movie that you take the whole family to and everyone walks away confused right like i don't even like like not really saying much to each other <laughs> yeah that said i i i saw this in theaters with my mom and, so did uh, i so did hey, i and uh I, I i remember i think we both liked it Mm-hmm. Uh, in 2008, that's what I vaguely remember. Mm-hmm. So, as a Fincher fanboy, I think I do like it because it is an outlier. Like, I'm someone that is just fascinated to see a creative person that I respect and am curious about tackle something unfamiliar, just because I want to see what they're gonna do with it. There's a lot of like projection and, and assuming here, but I would imagine it's one of the more personal stories for David Fincher, and I feel like it's. It knows what it's about in a very clear way. And I think Forrest Gump, we can talk about this a little bit. I'm sure themes are going to be a thing to talk about. Curse Case of Benjamin Button knows that it's a story about mortality and mm-hmm. life. And that like that's kind of Benjamin's superpower is that he kind of grew up in this place where death was always a part of life. And so he has the, like a kind of slightly different perspective on living one's life. And so I feel like that at various points in my life has hit me very hard when watching this movie. And I think that's the thing that sometimes I connect with. But I think that requires a lot of mental work from me as audience to like pull all of that apart and and invest mm-hmm. in that. I don't think it needs that much like mental work to to do. I mean, I, I think that's pretty much what the movie is deliberately doing. Mm. Okay, I'm going to come out right away with I don't know if this is a hot take or not. Okay. Who knows? I don't even I don't even know what like the the cultural consensus on Forrest Gump is in 2021. Uh, sure. So I feel like it's changed since the the 90s. I think that Benjamin Button is a more successful version of this than Forrest Gump. Mm-hmm. 
that it uh it's like i don't i don't even love the movie i like benjamin button uh forrest gump i find extremely frustrating and uh my general feeling with forrest gump is i feel like it is it is doing wildly two like two wildly different things and almost doesn't seem and, and like for me doesn't really reconcile them there's the st- really straight ahead sentimental like like nakedly emotional level of forrest gump mm-hmm. and then there is the darkly satirical aspect of it where everyone he encounters just dies yep. constantly mm. you know he'll meet a politician and then we'll just say in his voiceover, and then a few years later, some people shot that man because I yeah. guess they just didn't like what he was talking about. <laughs> and it's like, it's one thing if it's like doing like one of those, like I feel like the novel is just <laughs> the satirical stuff all the time, right. but it's doing both. And it's strange because like all of the stuff like with his relationship with Jenny is really straightforward. It is nothing satirical there at all. It is, it is just like, this is, it's deeply sincere. Mm-hmm. And but then also you look at this and Forrest Gump follows all he does for the whole movie is do what anyone tells him to do. He just he just follows orders. He does not think mm-hmm. for himself and he becomes wildly successful and everything pretty much goes great for him. He wins awards. He meets presidents. He becomes a war hero. He he becomes very rich. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jenny is the one who thinks for herself and is just trying to like escape an abusive household and and do her own thing. And she just is punished relentlessly for mm-hmm. years and years and years and years uh, and then dies of what I think is AIDS. Mm-hmm. And again, that is like and like the that's so dark. <laughs> but the movie doesn't play that as like that stuff as satire. And I feel like in Benjamin Button, it is so explicitly about death from the very beginning, from like the framing sequence with like Hurricane Katrina coming in to like ravage mm. this part of the country. The fact that he is literally like born out of death. Right. And that is what it, what it's about. And he is aware of what is going on around him in the way that Forrest Gump is not. It doesn't give me the whiplash that Forrest Gump does. And on that mm-hmm. level, I, I find it a more enjoyable, satisfying experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually had a, a pretty similar experience this time uh, watching them both. I hadn't seen Benjamin Button since the theater, and I saw Forrest Gump a ton when I was a teenager, but I hadn't seen it in, in 10 plus years. So first of all, I, I Benjamin Buttoned them. I watched them in reverse order. So I so it was like the the movie, which is more recent and more sort of, you know, elegantly put together production wise and all that kind of stuff was the one I watched first. And I had a similar feeling to you, Patrick, where I was like, well, th- there's so many, there's so much disjointed stuff in both the, these movies where like, now they're doing this. Now there's buttons. Now there's a thing, you know, like what, what's that? <laughs> but in Benjamin Button, it feels a little bit more consistent the whole way through. Whereas Forrest Gump, I, I definitely got that whiplash. There were scenes where I'm like, this feels like it's out of like a Judd Apatow movie. This feels like a joke scene, but like some scenes are supposed to be jokes. And then some scenes are not supposed to be jokes and they're all in this like the john lennon scene which is like this super corny like here are the lyrics to imagine but then it like zooms in on his face and he's like and then someone shot that man you know like you were saying i'm like oh now (laughs) i'm supposed to feel like emotional about this and then also on a personal level uh my girlfriend actually was one of the digital lighting artists on benjamin button so So, yeah Um, so very very good work there absolutely i agree um this is my first time ever watching with her so she was like pointing stuff out the uh scene where they he and daisy are under the table is uh, a scene that she lit entirely on her own and with for anyone who doesn't know what this means the cg work happens and then someone has to come in and actually put cg lights on everything to actually match so a lot of times when cg looks weird in a movie it's because the lighting is actually not matching the lighting in the room it's coming from weird places and stuff so it's like this huge very intensive uh, art form but that shot ended up winning like like her team won some like awards and like a BAFTA and all this kind of stuff. Wow. And it was on the cover of a magazine and everything. So, so she's cool. like pointing out all the little things she did and stuff. So obviously that was nice on a personal level, but just the movies themselves. I agree. I still like Forrest Gump a lot because it's just a movie I grew up with and stuff, but it was, I, I did sort of get exhausted watching it this time where every 20 minutes I'm like, right, he's a ping pong thing too. And okay. And yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's like what? there's so much happening here. Here's the thing though. Like, Listening to you guys talk, Michael, Patrick, Brian, Michael, you mentioned that you were kind of bringing a lot or to Benjamin Button or kind of like reading into it very generously um, to, you know, sort of get at its themes and why it's meaningful to you. I know what you mean in the sense that 
there is something that's sincerely contemplative about Benjamin Button, where I think dollar for dollar, Benjamin Button is thematically richer. Like it's exploring something that is more thematically complex. It's sort of this meditation on death and life and different places in life and what that means for our relationships and all of these things. It's very lyrical and complex in a way that Forrest Gump is absolutely not. Like Benjamin Button feels like a more mature movie. It feels in no way trite, right? So that is a something that, you know, you don't need to be a, a film expert to realize when you're watching Benjamin Button. And everything about the production quality of it conveys that to you in its tone, where it's like, here, grapple with death with us for a little while through this fable, which, you know, both of these movies are essentially fables. The problem is Benjamin Button is about a man who's born old and ages backwards <laughs> and unfortunately it's just goofy as hell like yep. i'm sorry it's just, forrest gump is the better movie for that reason at mm. the end of the day i really think and i just don't know any way around that because if you can't get over the premise and the premise just is weird and doesn't make any sense and doesn't work and isn't really grounded right that's the thing is that Benjamin Button is trying to play like it's this super grounded love story. Right, it's right. a love story. It's historical, <laughs> right? Here are these straight ahead historical events. World War II and people are dying and like, ah. But then <laughs> it's about a man who's born really old and right. is digitally, digitally aging backwards. Like when I watch it, I'm just like, I can just see Fitzgerald sitting drunkenly somewhere looking at a baby going like, this guy looks like an old man. Yeah. What, if, what if he was an old man? And that's all it is. Yeah. And, you know, at least Forrest Gump knows it's a comedy. For some reason, Benjamin Button hasn't realized that it's a comedy. Right. That's kind of where I land at the end of the day and where I think a lot of people, with why Forrest Gump is so beloved, I think, is that the, the personalities and the essence of the fable, like the characters in Forrest Gump, all of them are big, right? Lieutenant Dan right, is right. really big. Mm -hmm. Like Jenny even is big in her own way. And especially the other, like Bubba, come mm -hmm. on. Like these mm -hmm. are big characters. And that's who we expect to occupy, you know, sort of fables and folktales. Like this is an American sort of folktale. That's comedic. And Forrest Gump knows that. And so it's existing in its own space in the correct space of cinema for itself, right. which Benjamin Button is not, I'm sorry to say. Right. No, I, I totally agree with, with that. Because I was watching these movies going like, yeah, why not have these weird over-the-top parable adventures with these characters and stuff? But in a sort of Fincher way, Benjamin Button is trying to pretend like it isn't a big over the top adventure it's trying to pretend like it's sort of a quiet drama and i it works for me because i like the mood of the movie i just like like sort of the way i feel watching it and stuff but i agree that it's sort of it feels disjointed and stuff at the same time there is the as patrick was saying the disjointedness to forrest gump where you're like but how do you know you're a comedy <laughs> like at which point because i'm like the plot of every sequence of forrest gump is basically an inspector gadget episode sure <laughs> <laughs> Where yeah. like the 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 fool doesn't realize he saved the day, and at the end everyone's like, "Good job!" And he's like, "I did. I guess I did. I'm always on duty, you know." And it's just like, okay. I mean, it's that <laughs> except other people just die or lose their legs, and he's just like, "Oops, oops." <laughs> yeah, this is all true. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't actually argue with any of this, and I think these are the things where like I like Benjamin Button Moore's movie, and I do like it. But these are the things that, like, I have an easier time buying into just the mere premise of it than the, clearly than Trisha does. <laughs> Honestly, I, I think that little prologue thing with uh, Monsieur Gateau and, like, the clock going the clock. backwards and stuff like that, yeah. Yeah. sort of, like, it's fun. Okay, because from this, I, I get a very, like, Jean-Pierre Jeunet vibe from that level of kind of like like because there is whimsy in in Benjamin sure. Button there is the 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 guy who got struck by lightning seven times mm -hmm. and things like that mm -hmm. for me like that little like story at the beginning kind of sets the tone where it's like this is going to be you know uh more somber more grounded than Forrest Gump obviously but it is also 
a fable and you do look at sections of it like you look at the the visuals of when he's out on the tugboat initially and it does feel like i mean even though it, it's like in the real world and in history it looks kind of like a fairy tale the bullets are lasers <laughs> exactly like bullets sometimes are lasers <laughs> yeah. right and I do think if it if it could reconcile all of these things better, I think it could be a great movie. And I don't think it is, but I still like it. And in the way that, for instance, it's at least for me, like, even if not everything clicks together perfectly, I feel like it is at least like sort of emotionally consistent with like, I know how to pretty much feel about everything going through. Mm -hmm. And the thing with Forrest Gump, I'm just like, a lot of it is like, I don't know what you're saying. I don't know <laughs> how you want me to react to this. Do you even know what, like, on the one hand, like, yes, they do get that it is like, it is big and it is like inherently kind of funny, but still with a lot of, I'm like, I, are you sure what you're saying here? Is Forrest Gump supposed, like, is, is the joke that by following orders, he's like, you know, he succeeds and like, you should not like think for yourself uh is is the point supposed to be that he is a harbinger of of destruction and death <laughs> wherever he goes this these are the things where the movie does not really want me to think about these things i i mean like based no. on the way it was received the movie wants everyone to just be like cheering and crying and fully on board with all of it mm. and that's why it like confuses me so much even though it is a very watchable well put together well acted movie yeah definitely i just wish there was some shadow of a doubt or some other kind of fairy tale construction to benjamin button one thing benjamin button really reminds me of is big fish right and i love big fish big fish is great but big fish works because the stories within the frame story of the dying parent are fiction, right? And, you know, Billy Crudup's character in that movie doesn't really know what's strictly fiction and what's embellishment, right? But there's this helpful construction in like, well, he says this about his life. I don't really believe it, but there's probably an element of truth in there, right? So we're watching essentially a biopic, but of, you know, the life of Edward Bloom, uh, which is Albert Finney's character. Um, also, you know, Ewan McGregor. Ewan McGregor. Thank you. I was like, Obi-Wan Kenobi, also played <laughs> by him. But there's this helpful framework where there's a sort of a fairy tale, tall tale, you know, veneer over the whole thing. And, you know, at the end, we see sort of there are these elements of truth in it. But, you know, he thought it was fiction the whole time. If Benjamin Button were like that, where it's like we're reading this journal of this person and, you know, if Kate Blanchett's character were like, you know, I saw him a few times and he seemed younger, but he said he was aging backwards. I don't really know. He seemed like he existed out of time. If there was some kind of doubt from her where she was not completely, if she didn't nurse him while he died as a baby, <laughs> <laughs> then it'd be a little bit more affecting, I think, where you're not your brain's not doing the like, this is literally true. The movie wants me to believe it's literally true. Mm. I think, honestly, hearing you talk about this, if it wasn't explicitly Hurricane Katrina. That's a big problem of it. Yes. Yeah, that's goofy. Hmm. I like the idea of a hurricane, of this impending, like, you know, it, sure. it's, it's like, like this like apocalyptic, like feeling mm -hmm. coming in, like, like. It's like the end of her life and this destruction is just like on its way. I like that. But Katrina places it, and especially in 2008, places it yeah. so clearly in like immediate recent history in our world. And if you just if you just kind of like erased the Katrina part, I think that would actually like go a long way towards some of this stuff. Because yeah. he's, he's not meeting a lot of other historical figures. It's like like World right. War One and Two happened, but I mean, he's not like on the front lines in the way that you know right. Forrest Gump went to exactly. Vietnam, calling Watergate <laughs> in to the yeah right <laughs> right <laughs> yes yeah. So I think there's something interesting about the time that we're kind of talking about the the time that these movies were released, like the years that they were released, and and I think the premise thing is definitely true trisha i had a friend when the trailer came out that was like that's the most disturbing trailer i've ever seen and i will never see this movie wait for mm. benjamin button <laughs> for benjamin button i will yes. say that initial teaser trailer the one set to oh my god the, the, the yeah the aquarium is genuinely one of my favorite like teaser trailers of all time it's it's beautiful, I, it's beautiful. right 
but it really creeped out a friend of mine. So it, so I think there are just fundamental, like the premise that's not going to click for people. I think there there's something interesting about Benjamin Button coming out in 2009 or 2008 and Forrest Gump in 1994. When I was watching Forrest Gump, rewatching it, I was like, I don't think they could make this movie anymore. Like, right. like people don't go see movies like this. Also, could Tom Hanks get away with that performance now? I mean, the Tropic no. Thunder trailer feels like less ridiculous than it right. did in 2008. Exactly. Yeah. There's a whole can of worms there. Also. Yeah. Yeah. So it feels like this relic of a time where like that was a kind of movie that could exist. And that would be like you're saying, Patrick, like celebrated. And to, like, I remember hearing about it all the time, but like wasn't allowed to watch it because rated R. And then we watched it, I think, in like a social studies class in middle school as like a way to learn about American history and blah, blah, blah. Also, Forrest Gump page PG-13. I was going to say, Forrest Gump is not rated R. Right. I think, I mean, my parents were strict about certain things. <laughs> yeah, it feels rated R by today's standards. In your parents' mind, <laughs> it was rated R. <laughs> yeah. And so, Curious Case Benjamin Button, I feel like coming out in 2008, it almost, like, I think at that point, we couldn't have had a Forrest Gump. So I think the Fincher approach to it is maybe the only way that we could like deal with it sorry we could have had a big fish though i'm sorry we could have. big fish was like 2003 though i mean mm. a thing i'm gonna throw out here is because i feel like especially now looking at forrest gump one of the major talking points about it is that it is basically just like the ultimate boomer celebration it, i mean truly <laughs> we are the best generation look at all the cool stuff we lived through no <laughs> right. one had as good a time in the 20th century as us and that perspective also was uh, on, on like boomers and that generation was different in like the, in the post 9-11 world of, sure. of Benjamin Button. So like, I don't think they would necessarily make the, a movie that's like just like going through the greatest hits of like the 60s <laughs> right. and 70s and all that stuff in the same way. Forrest Gump is such a quintessential mid 90s movie in that way. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I think I want to mention about Katrina is that, you know, watching the behind the scenes for Curious Case of Benjamin Button, which are really interesting. And I recommend it as pretty much all of the behind the scenes that exist for Fincher's films. They're much more in depth and reveal like this is what filmmaking looks like. And it isn't just we interviewed the cast on set and they talk about the movie that you just watched. Right. But they like while they were shooting and prepping shooting is when Katrina hit. And I think it like destroyed a bunch of sets. And like so it was kind of written into the movie because it had affected the movie and the crew and the places that they were shooting. And so like at the time it felt like, oh, this should be part of the DNA of the movie and like mm. these people's experience because we were there. So it's interesting to hear about that and then think about it like mm. you're saying, Patrick, and like you were suggesting, Trisha, that it, it does ground things in such a reality. Like in Forrest Gump, you cut back to him on the bench and occasionally yeah. I'm like, really, he's been talking about all of this in the last like hour to this person that's been sitting it's so, like there's some unbelievability there but it's a very different kind than like here i am with my dying mother yeah right revealing right. to her daughter that her actual father was a baby old man that grew <laughs> into a <laughs> right. young baby old, old man baby you, you're doing it for me thank you <laughs> um can i bring up the question of eric roth please because i feel like this is part of the premise of this episode does anyone have Eric Roth's filmography handy? It is fascinating because he has genuinely an incredible filmography. Yes. Mm. He is a legend. Starting in the 70s, but then like really like post Forrest Gump, The Insider and Ali and Munich mm -hmm. and uh, and then, you know, uh, A Star is Born. He has Dune coming out like yep. later this mm. year. He, I mean, he's just been one of the major like like premier just Hollywood dramatic screenwriters for decades now. And uh, and it seems like he can kind of, you know, work on what he wants. Uh, he's, you know, won enough or at least like made enough like awards favorite movies at this point. When I was first fascinated by like the, this topic that, you know, these movies being so weirdly similar. OK, I, I spent like maybe an hour searching for interviews with Eric Roth where he talked about it or said something about the fact that he wrote like th these like b bizarre, like not identical, but twin movies. Like a couple times when Benjamin Button was coming out, some people were like, you know, this has a lot of similarities to that other movie that you mm -hmm. wrote. And he was like, you know, I, 
I, I didn't even really think about it very much. I, I guess there are some things in common, but I think they're pretty different. Like, I don't know if he's just like play if this is like a, you know, an <laughs> acting or whatever, but he does not get into it at all. And no one pushes him on this. And I don't know. Could any of you find <laughs> any other stuff where he talks about it? Because it is. I think genuinely insane that that someone has not been like, can we do a long sit down interview where you just explain this to us? Because why right. did you do this twice? Is this you asking Eric Roth for a long sit down interview? <laughs> right. right you know what? You guys have had screenwriters on the show before. Can you see if you can get <laughs> Eric Roth? Get Eric Roth? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just want to know. Like, at, <laughs> Here's my thing. How many years was it after Forrest Gump like, won every award in the world, made all the money in the world? Did he decide, I want to write this other movie and I'm going to do it almost exactly the same? I'm going to take that story, that that bizarre, like drunken F. Scott Fitzgerald story <laughs> and just do like a companion piece to Forrest Gump. Was he like upset that Zemeckis made it too sentimental and he was like, no, it's about <laughs> death. I'm going to make it more explicitly about death. I'm just really hoping that Dune opens with Kyle MacLachlan being like, did I ever tell you the story about the time I was... <laughs> Well, the only thing that I re I saw was that actually both of Eric Roth's parents passed away while he was working on Benjamin Button. Mm. So, you know, obviously the story is already about death and, and obviously Fincher is bringing his own thing to it. But that's kind of, I think, something that is pretty present in the work, as we were mentioning. Yeah. And I think Fincher's dad passed like early 2000. So mm -hmm. I haven't watched an interview where he directly addresses this. But speaking of Big Fish, I did watch uh, an interview conducted by John August, John August interviewing Eric Roth. And we did get to talk to John August way back toward the beginning of the podcast. And that was really fun. Maybe, maybe just like email and be like, hey, you can you can you get Eric to come <laughs> can on the you show? Connect us. Yeah. But so something that Eric Roth was talking about was his process. And it was really interesting to hear, first of all, just how long he's been around and how mm -hmm. he's aware, but like can casually say like, yeah, well, you know, I like I worked with Kurosawa and I've worked with Spielberg and Martin Scorsese and like Leo had some notes on this thing in a way that doesn't feel like name droppy, but just like I'm in the industry, like I'm in this business. I am a story craftsman and that's like what I do. But he was talking about his process being very like intuitive, like he doesn't do a whole lot of outlining and he just sits at his like MS DOS program that he still mm -hmm. uses or or something crazy like that. Yeah. And every morning, you know, writes the first scene. The next day he reads what he's written and then writes more. The next day he reads what he's written and write writes more. And so I could see him in his process from this the little bit I've gleaned, not realizing as he's adapting the story that it became the kind of right, same right. thing that he had done for Forrest Gump. Well, it reminds me of because there, there genuinely are artists who don't look back on their careers and stuff who just sort of think about the next thing. And I think that can be very positive because it means that you're not dwelling on the past. You're not you're not sort of well, hopefully you're not like recycling things on <laughs> purpose, not. at least. Right. But yeah. the downside, obviously, is that you don't remember what you've done. And it makes me think of um, we've probably talked about this in the, on uh, the podcast before, but the Aaron Sorkin Sorkinisms supercut videos mm -hmm. there's like three of them on right. youtube which is like characters saying the exact same line word for word in three different sorkin projects and i think it's so much that there's no way he's like going back over scripts being like that was good let's put that in here that was good right. let's put that in here because he wrote like freaking every episode of the west way right like or most of them the first four seasons yeah for, of, the, of the first four seasons also so, to be to be fair aaron sorkin was doing a lot of cocaine back then of course <laughs> yes <laughs> yes but just i i sort of think of it as like when you hear your you know dad tell the same story over and over again or something like that like he doesn't realize he's not going back over his notes of the last time he hung out with this group of people and being like did i tell this last time he's just like boom 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 here i am and here's what i got and, and that kind of thing the only problem with screenwriting is then that is in stone for the rest of time now where people can look back and be like oh you did the, this thing here and you did this thing here and you did this thing here but i think that it's it's not surprising that some artists just aren't really paying attention to that stuff and benjamin button and forrest gump feel like completely different movies from the outside you know what i mean you would never think of those two movies as anything similar if you had only seen them 20 years ago and didn't remember them or anything like that. But when you actually look at them back to back, you're like, holy crap, these movies are the same movie. So it's a weird external internal kind of thing that, that is there. And I do just want to quickly mention that also 
Robin Swicord, who's a wonderful screenwriter and does primarily book to film adaptations. She wrote Little she, Women 94, right? She wrote 90, 1994 Little Women, yeah. which is a fantastic movie. Uh, but she also worked on the adaptation of Matilda from 96. She mm. did Memoirs of a Geisha, Jane Austen Book Club. This is kind of her thing is is what she does. And she also worked on the story and uh, like actually, you know, she has a story credit on Benjamin Button. And so it wasn't just Eric Roth sitting in a room by himself, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, right. He so she wrote the initial draft and then he uh, took yeah. it and made it more like Forrest Gump. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Bingo. But also, who knows at what point David Fincher, you know, stepped in and was right, also bringing right. all of the Fincherness to it. Right. So I think it's a little bit more shrouded in the case of Benjamin Button. I mean, development always is. But, right. you know, I think especially in that case, I think Eric Roth is it's not like every single word of Benjamin Button was started in the brain of Eric Roth. And then here we are. Right. 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 Yeah. Like, I think even Spielberg was developing it for a while. Like, yeah. I think it was in development for a long time and people mm-hmm. couldn't crack it slash visual effects just weren't there to, to do it. And then were they in 2008? I think they are pretty impressive. I mean, I, I think this looks pretty good. I would argue this looks better than most modern de-aging. I feel like the, the best of the best shots in this feel like they could be like today and are better than... I mean, I think a really key thing about it, like, like I think the reason why a lot of the VFX shots in this work better than, let's say, some of it in, like, Marvel movies is that, like, when you have the digital de-aging in, like, a Marvel movie, it's in this, like, you got, like, this high-key lighting where it's just, like, everyone is really well lit and they're out in, like, yeah. just, like, right. like, a brightly lit room. And uh, so every flaw in the VFX is on display. And then in this, like, when... Brad Pitt shows up again in the dance studio near the end. It's mm-hmm. one of the best examples. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, he is like shrouded in darkness. It's, I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's the classic. It, Very smart. Yeah, yes. it, it's 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 the T Rex in Jurassic Park. It's like let's put it at night with like mm-hmm. rain to uh to you know, help like you know disguise the visual effects and blend them into the scene. Like let's put this this VFX shot in heavy shadows so it you know it's not jumping out at you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Also great makeup. Just like the 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 gradual evolution of like these characters aging and de-aging over the course is like almost like shot to shot because a lot of it is kind of like you know montagey. Is it's I I still think it's impressive as hell. Yeah, I, th- I think the the unfortunate thing is the first couple times. Uh, you see him it's it's like some of the worst work so that I think yes. that like your brain is like oh this doesn't look good today but then I found myself not just because of my you know again personal connection to it but like I found myself as it went on and it became more like Brad Pitt you know as an old man kind of stuff I was like oh this works and I like can't see the CG-ness for 90 maybe 80 90 percent of the of the shots um, unless I look really hard for it but you're right that like the first few shots are just like, they're not great. No. Yeah. I mean, I think it's like, for me, it, it doesn't take me out of the movie ultimately. Whereas like something like Rogue One, where they like go really hard on it, like, <sighs> yeah, takes yeah. me out of it a little Sure. Bit. Again, it's also, you know, when we know, like when we know Brad Pitt is in the movie and it's like, I mean, it's the same thing as like when a character has like just makeup on. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. they are, we know that's them. And that that this, a thing is being done to make them look different for this part. That's not even the same scenario as like, let's just make a person who is now dead completely from, from scratch <laughs> right, right, right. on right. screen. Right. And they're not there in person. Or let's put Kate Blanchett's voice here in Elle Fanning while she's... That's what it was, right? I was like, something's wrong here. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that choice is the one either. That was I mean, bizarre. it's the same thing where... Wait, which one is that? All of the young them have adult voices. Elle Fanning is there with her red hair and she's pretending to be... Dave Checking Benny. out old Benjamin, which is weird. Yep. <laughs> and there it is. Kate Blanchett's voice coming right out of her mouth. And I just... It's... Okay. If you can just get on board with this premise immediately when you see old man baby Benjamin Button and like you're, yes, I'm here for it. Great. And God bless you if that's you, then maybe you're fine with Kate Blanchett's voice in right. Al Fanning, you know, then and maybe the rest of it where 
It's like all the, you know, again, for the time, it was really impressive work, but it's still like the strings are showing. I just feel that they are. And, and part of that is because of the premise. Can I just say, I have never noticed Kate Blanchett's voice coming out of Elle Fanning. Really? It had to be pointed out to me. I, I didn't realize. Really? I clocked that something was weird. Right. But that's what it I wasn't did. until someone told me what it was that I was like, oh, that's why this feels off. Yeah. But it did feel off. I remember sitting in the movie theater being like, wow, we made this choice? <laughs> Maybe. I think I'm just stupid. I just, I, I, I didn't <laughs> notice it in the theater. Say, yeah. And I did not notice it today. <laughs> kind of one of the last things I want to talk about for with both of these movies, this kind of dovetails into it, is that I think these movies, despite their flaws, are really interesting in their episodic nature. Mm. Yes. And I think both of them have episodes that are amazing. And the casts of these films are great. And it's weird because when I think about Forrest Gump, I kind of forget how big of a role Lieutenant Dan plays. Like he's oh, yeah. there for so much of the movie and he's a really important character to have on this journey with him. But like him and Bubba, like the whole Vietnam sequence, like mini episode is really powerful. Like I feel like you get to know him and Bubba and then you kind of understand Lieutenant Dan and his family because they have those fun flashbacks. And then by the end, you know, you've gone on this whole journey and it's really great. And so I think about that a lot. And I think about in a curious case of Benjamin Button when he's in Russia and, you know, Brad Pitt and Tilda Swinton getting to have like night hotel love Caviar. story <laughs> develop. Yeah. Like I feel like those are two that stand out to me as like these little stories within these bigger movies mm -hmm. I find really enjoyable, partially because the actors are so great and it's fun to get to mm -hmm. see, like see that play out as, as part of these bigger journeys that we're on. Mm -hmm. I totally forgot or did not forgot. I never didn't know that Mahershala was in Benjamin Button. And I was like, Taraji and Mahershala together this again, but for the first time. For right. hidden figures. See, I thought you were going to say Jared Harris, who I also right. completely I also, forgot was in Benjamin same. Button and is really great in this. Yeah, so great. Yeah. As uh, in everything. And doesn't kill himself for once. It's really nice. Yay. Uh, it's so nice. <laughs> but that is the thing. I think because these are these are long episodic movies, e like regardless of your feelings about them as wholes, there's like chapters in all of them that I feel yeah. like everyone can get on board with. Yeah, like... Uh, you know, like I am not crazy about Forrest Gump in general, but I'm just like, I don't know. When he gets into ping pong, I'm pretty <laughs> on board with that. I'm right. having a great time. And uh, that, yeah, I, Lieutenant Dan being very sad in a bar on New Year's. I'm on. Also, Lieutenant Dan is importantly that the only character in Forrest Gump who realizes this is really screwed up and what's right. the deal with you and why right. does this keep happening to you? Yeah. My take on that is he is the Frank Grimes of. Forrest Gump. <laughs> I love the the Tilda Swinton section of Benjamin Button. There is right. specifically one shot that is like burned into my mind of her in an elevator yep, with yep, like yep. the hat down and like the hat casting a shadow down over half her mm -hmm. face. Like it, it's beautiful. Also, this is the first movie shot by Claudio Miranda. And mm. uh very nice. They, uh, he does a really great job. But yeah, but there are all these little chapters. Oh, actually, one thing uh that I actually think is relevant to bring up comparing these two movies is the perspective um in them because like mm -hmm. forrest gump is told explicitly from mm -hmm. forrest gump's perspective he is telling this story to basically us the whole mm -hmm. time but benjamin button is kind of like filtered a little bit where it's like from his diaries but it's his diaries being read mm -hmm. and then like annotated kind of by like dying kate blanchett and then also, like, there, there's pages torn out. So it is, like, it's not straight from him. That also gives the movie, like, this different tone where it's, mm -hmm. like, he ha he is, he's being selective, I feel like, about what he, he, he puts in, in, into the book and all of that. Which does also raise the question of the section where he talks about Daisy getting hit by the car. The Magnolia sequence? The Magnolia yeah. sequence. Where he somehow knows what everyone was doing for the last 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah. He suddenly has this this like omniscient view of everything right. happening in Paris that he doesn't have for the rest of it. Sure. It's magic, you guys. Yeah. Because everything in Benjamin Button is magic. Right. I feel like, you know, maybe the cops came and were like, this is what happened. And the, like the cab driver explained this. The, I don't know. If you reach far enough, 
you can get to it. The time that he spent in Paris, he was interviewing everyone involved. <laughs> he was right. doing detective work. He's right. like, I know what happened, but I need to know exactly who is to blame. Right, exactly. Right. Why the did you forget The broken shoelace. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that, that's one of those sequences that like, it works in a movie that's told by a, by a narrator who is omniscient. You know what you get in like Magnolia or something. I'm not saying Magnolia works. If Ricky J were narrating that. Ricky J, this is what I was gonna say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you get so no, you get so many of those, like, like, oh, this this thing happened. And then this is like there's plenty of those movies from like the nineties and, and early aughts, right? But this is like, wait a minute, it's like the Hobbit problem of like you're telling the story, but how but you weren't there for some of this. So like what's going on here? In terms of the uh the the sort of sequences, the chapters and stuff. Another thing that I appreciate is this sort of frame story thing of like Forrest Gump, Fight Club, Benjamin Button, where it's like it, the, the story is being told to you as entirely as a flashback, basically. And I think the, the cool thing about all of those movies is the story is not over at the during the telling of the flashback. And I think Forrest Gump and Fight Club get a, do it a lot better than Benjamin Button because Benjamin Button, all that is left to happen is this relationship with with Daisy and her daughter and then and then Katrina coming in basically but Forrest Gump and Fight Club both sort of do this thing where they're like and now we're here and there's like 20 minutes of story left what actually happens now the story is not finished yet and i think that's really cool too is that i think there are plenty of movies if a romantic comedy opened with the couple telling their kids like do you ever tell you how you know i met your mom and it's like well Okay, so we know the entire outcome of the story now, you know, and I think that these are movies where we don't know the outcome. We don't actually know what is happening, even though we are with this character in present day. And I think there's there's something cool to that, too. Yes, I agree. I think, though, that where the ending falls or sort of like the final chapter of the story falls in comparison does something different in Forrest Gump because of who Forrest Gump is and sort of the overall tone of the movie, there's this assuredness from us. We get, as an audience, get this assuredness that Forrest Gump is going to be fine. Right. So whenever like crazy stuff is happening around Forrest Gump, we're like, that dude is fine. We know him. Mm -hmm. He's on a bench. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he's pretty glib about everything that's going on. Or he's just, you know, nonchalant, I suppose, kind of telling his life story, even when he's talking about the deaths of people, as you pointed out, Patrick, where it does this total thing where we are kind of relaxed at every moment where even when bombs are going off around Forrest Gump, we're like, Forrest Gump is okay. Even if everybody else around him is, you know, possibly going to die and probably will. But because of the absence of Benjamin Button in the frame story, we're filtering this through the, the POV of someone who is already dying. And we know Benjamin is not there. Right. We're pretty assured from the beginning of Benjamin Button that Benjamin is dead yeah. by the time the movie starts. That's reasonable to assume. It, again, creates this more melancholy sort of tone to Benjamin Button, where we know how the story ends, and it ends with Benjamin's death. Right. Probably, wherever it's going from here, Benjamin is not going to make it out alive in a way that we're for sure Forrest Gump is going to make it out alive and okay. So it creates this different sort of like stake to the whole thing. Not that I think anybody you know, reasonable thinks Benjamin is going to die on the boat in World War II, right? <laughs> when there's still <laughs> right. one and a half hours of movie left to go. I don't think anyone thinks that's what's going to happen. But it does, again, there's, there's this weight to death by having the main character having already died by the time the movie begins. Right. That Benjamin Button really sort of dwells in and is very affecting. Like, you know, I'm sitting here talking crap about Benjamin Button because I think it's funny to do so, and I'm allowed. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it, it's really affecting. You know, both of these movies make me cry for totally different reasons, though. Right. 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 Like, um, for Forrest Gump is mostly just because of Alan Silvestri's score. Right. Um, and and Benjamin Button is because it, it really you know has this sort of it hits you in different ways in more complex ways. I mean, it's definitely a better ending than if Daisy was like. Uh, nurse bring in bring him in and then the nurse brings in this like <laughs> newborn <laughs> and she's like this is your father say hello uh, oh, I don't know. god oh god oh god and and then and then they die together as like the, the waves come good night daisy yeah. good night benjamin i would give them some some points if they did that because it would be so deeply weird like it's a weird movie but yeah. that 
especially if Katrina came in and destroyed the hospital, that would be one of the strangest movie endings of all time. <laughs> right. Yeah. But like, but this, this, but this is the thing. I mean, right. The, like, you know, in the beginning, little like prologue thing, there's this clockmaker whose son dies in the war and makes this clock that goes backwards because he likes the, the idea that maybe we can go back and like bring the things that we lose, you know, back to us. And then at the end of the movie, you see like, the clock just in a basement as like a hurricane is coming in and just like washing it away. Like everything dies. That is like the point. <laughs> it's like, ev- like, you know, even if you get, <laughs> even if as you get old, you're really getting young and hot, you're still going to die. <laughs> you're yeah, right. still dying. Right. You're slowly turning into Brad Pitt, but you're still going to die. We yeah. all end up in diapers. Yep. To defend Forrest Gump a little bit, because I feel like there's been a lot of like, pro uh curious case benjamin button happening a little bit i will say that i think one of the things i also because i also love forrest gump and i also like you brian watched it a ton when i was a kid Mm -hmm. for the trailer for forrest gump also made me cry like it was like i saw it just when i was getting into trailers and making movies and it's like a three minutes and 45 seconds it's the whole goddamn movie Uh but the score is like it's it's absurd it's over the top but it made me cry but i do think that there's something that is Interesting, like you were saying, Trisha, like both movies make me cry, but for different reasons. Forrest Gump, I don't read him as much as like, you know, this is how you should live your life or like this is, you know, be like Forrest Gump. He's kind of like a, you know, a, like holding up a mirror to society almost. And of course, you know, I think, you know, when he's in the army, I feel like that's the most one of the most clear like places, right, where he's like the sergeant comes over and it's like, why are you such a genius, Gump? And what are you here to do? He's like, well, I just do whatever you're saying. He's like, you're going to be a general. That's like exactly what the art. So there's like <laughs> a ton of commentary happening. But what I always find, and, and so kind of along the way, you're kind of looking at this is why I was mentioning the trailer. One of the lines in the trailer is like, look at the world through the eyes of Forrest Gump. And I think that is really like interesting. And I like stories that kind of show us how weird our normal lives are. And I think mm-hmm. Forrest Gump manages to do that a lot of the time. But it also sets up this ending that, like we're all saying here, there is a change that happens. And it, you know, once we're with Forrest, I remember being like startled because suddenly I wasn't safe anymore. Like you were saying, Trisha, like where you're seeing him go on this journey, suddenly we're in real time and it's like, what's what's going to happen? And if like that does a lot of work to also set up the most beautiful scene of acting ever where Tom Hanks comes in, finds out Forrest has, you know, he has a son. And for like the first time ever, basically, do you see him like acknowledge how yes. difficult like life is? Right. Yeah. Uh, when he asks, you know, is he is he smart or is he like me? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's just like it's a beautiful moment from Tom Hanks, obviously. But I feel like that's also when the movie takes this weird like left turn and like suddenly hits me with this sledgehammer of emotion of like, oh, God, like, yes. Wow, that's it's just really powerful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I just want to be very clear here. I know I have mostly like criticized Forrest Gump. I think that scene is genuinely incredible. Same. Mm-hmm. My issue with the movie is I've said like it often doesn't to me doesn't seem to know what it, it it's saying or how it wants us to feel about things. I feel like that is a scene that where there is like it knows exactly what it's doing. It is like it is so clear about about everything. There is no doubt about its intentions, about its function. Everything is working perfectly. And uh, yeah, I, I think that's like so easily the best scene in the movie. And I'm like, even when like with all of my issues, like up until then, I right there, I'm, I'm just like, God damn it, this this, this works. This is <laughs> this real. This really works. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. And I will say that Forrest Gump, I think ultimately he holds together sort of better than Benjamin Button does, where Benjamin Button, I think, is kind of sort of taking bigger risks because it's, you know, operating on this sort of thin ice of a premise that could break at any moment and often does for me. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But Forrest Gump is held together pretty concretely throughout. Part of that is is Tom Hanks's amazing performance and just commitment to that performance throughout. But part of it is Jenny. I think that the counterpoint of the Jenny story with, you know, nothing bad is ever going to happen to Forrest Gump. And we know that. And so we're able to have fun on that ride. But a lot of bad stuff happens to Jenny 
all the time. Yeah. And Robin Wright is incredible always. Mm -hmm. But her performance here and the Jenny storyline is the only thing that makes us care about what happens to Forrest. Forrest doesn't change. He's not capable of changing. So there's no arc to the movie unless he changes someone that we care about. And he he ends up changing everyone, right? He changes Lieutenant Dan um, in, in a really big way. And the other people he encounters are dramatically affected by the actions that Forrest Gump takes. But unless he changes someone that we care about, like Jenny, we're not going to care at all about this movie. Mm -hmm. And he really does. His presence, you know, changes her life. And, and her life is just the story of sort of ongoing tragedy over and over again. And so at the end of the movie, the scene that you guys are talking about, where we kind of finally get to see that Jenny has stabilized and found her feet and, you know, has this incredible son and like all of the things that are coming together in that scene, it's because it's the culmination of Jenny's storyline too. Right. And her presence in that scene, just her complete, for the first time ever, she is the one who is okay. And Forrest is so shaken up. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you know, knocked off his feet by what's going on. It's just really, really beautiful. And everything before pours into that scene and pours into the whole final chapter of Forrest Gump where, you know, Jenny is finally the one who's like, would you marry me, Forrest, right? You know, and mm -hmm. that's inverting things. It's it's playing the same melody, but in a slightly different way. Yeah, it, she's such a critical part of it. And and the movie, yeah, like you're saying, it, it earns that moment in a way that I feel like this time, more than any other time, I didn't see coming. Like watching Forrest Gump this time, I was sort of having this a little bit of that whiplash of like, what is this movie? And like, now we're here and like ping pong, blah, blah, blah. And then like, it just comes and like funnels down into this beautiful point where this happens. And then it's like Jenny like has to die and it's so sad, but like, yeah, that she wants to like marry for like, I feel like the movie takes a really like intense emotional turn and it feels a little bit like out of place, not in like a wrong way, but just. It caught me off guard, I guess, watching it this time, because so much of the movie does have this whimsy to it and a, a certain sense that everything is going to be OK, that then to like have it be such a bittersweet like ending. I don't know. It's intense. It's not fair. There's a decent amount of movie left. Right. That's the thing. Right. Is that after Forrest gets off that bench, there's a whole chunk of movie left mm -hmm. yeah. and none of it is the same kind of movie as the movie we've just seen up until that point. Yeah. You know, there's a whole other discussion that we could have about like biopics and what is the purpose of them. But it but it is interesting that in both of these movies. That's a whole other Patrick video. We already have the Zemeckis <laughs> video. <laughs> so okay, so just to check, you when you say biopics, you just mean like movies about uh of characters like like a cradle to grave. Basically, that's right. Like okay. like fake biopics. Yeah, that's how I'm thinking about it. Not not in the way about like real people, unless there is a Benjamin Button. <laughs> 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 and, right. and and Eric Roth just knows about these these unique people and he just needs to tell their Eric stories. Eric Roth is actually aging backwards. Yeah. Is the thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Based on the interview I saw with him, I don't think so, but maybe. <laughs> but Michael, I know, I know what you mean about just like this format of like telling. The thing that I find so fascinating is so there's a, a sequel to the Forrest Gump book, mm -hmm. which I read when I was like 17. Gump and Co. Yeah. Yeah, that in which the Forrest Gump movie exists. And apparently, like what Tom Hanks has said is that they were talking about making a sequel to the movie and then 9-11 happened and they're just like, maybe we just don't, don't deal with this. Yeah. yeah, mm -hmm. Probably the right way to go. Probably. Yep. I mean, I don't know. He goes to space. <laughs> <laughs> Could be fun. Tom, Tom Hanks and Gary Sinise already went to space together. Right. It's fun. And it went great. And it was <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> there were no problems. Why don't we move to lessons? What lessons we're going to take away from Curious Case of Benjamin Button and Forrest Gump? Brian, do you want to start us off? I think one thing that struck me this time watching both of these movies was the sort of exposition that comes from a naive character narrating stuff that they don't understand, but we, the audience, understand. And that's a very specific thing, but I think this is a, a lesson that you can take and put in any script basically which is that sort of one uh, two plus two kind of thing of like 
the the script has given you this much and you totally get that what it's actually saying is this. So one example is, you know, start off on a disturbing one, but like, oh, her daddy, Jenny's daddy must have really loved her because he was always touching her and that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? So it's mm-hmm. like we know that Forrest doesn't get it, but we get it. And there's no th- there's nothing other than that subtext in that line where we're like, oh, got it, you know, and then, you know, when when Forrest is running through the football field and they uh, he says, who's that? He says, that's Forrest Gump, just a local idiot. And then the next line is Forrest saying, and would you believe it? I got to go to college, too. Mm -hmm. And it's like we put together so much from those two lines of like he told him he was an idiot, but he saw him running. And therefore, that's all you need to get to college, you know, and then in Benjamin Button, you have the the clockmaker story uh, where the son goes to war. And then it says the next like line of, of narration is, and then one day a letter came. And as soon as you hear that line, you're like, okay, I get it. You know? And then I think the next line is, and their son came home. And you're like, okay, I get it. And of course, the yep. script does confirm, like, okay, he came home in a casket, they buried him, blah, blah, blah. But we are putting all that together before, before the script is telling us. You know? And I think that there's a, lot of, there's a lot of good examples of how to do that in both of these movies where... You only need to give the audience, and it especially works with a naive character, right? Because you can have naive characters say something that they don't fully understand, but we as the audience hearing it fully understand. But even without that, there's just a lot of really good examples of how to only put the, the sort of minimal required amount into the script for the audience to go, got it. All right. You don't have to say anything else. I totally get what you meant by that. Check. So yeah, that was, that was the thing that struck me. Mm Mm-hmm. This is actually kind of related to my lesson a little bit. Okay, yeah, go for it. I want to talk a little bit about symbols and Jenny's house. Mm-hmm. And Jenny's house is a really great example of a recurring symbol in Forrest Gump. And it's it's only in three places. We only see it really like three times. And it does exactly the three things that a recurring symbol should do, where the first time we see it, it represents everything about Jenny's childhood, the abuse, the disadvantage and the pain, right? And we understand, by the way, that's such a a critical piece of Jenny's backstory that informs everything we know about Jenny. That's all you need to know about that character. And so every single choice that she makes is loaded for with empathy from us. Like, we're never going to judge Jenny. We know where she came from. We've seen the house. Then when she comes back to Forrest in the middle of the movie, And she goes down the lane and she just starts picking up rocks and throwing rocks at the house. We understand it's this visual representation of the struggle we've just watched. Jenny has been throwing rocks at this house her entire life, Mm -hmm. right? Trying to get past this thing and has, you know, so far been unable to do so. And and we see it's very literalized. We see her miss and miss and miss as she's Mm. trying to hit this house with rocks. And then I, lo- Robin Wright's performance is amazing. I love the line from Forrest where sometimes there just aren't enough rocks, hmm. right? This thing is so big, you can't get past it. And then the moment at the end where Forrest has the house bulldozed to the ground yeah, right. is just so incredibly beautiful. That's it's weeping. Sobbing. We're all just weeping. Right. Yeah, same. <laughs> but it's because it's a symbol that is textually established to mean something, reinforced to mean that same thing, and then brought back and recontextualized. And it gives us that catharsis at the end when we clearly understand what the symbol means, when Forrest has that house bulldozed to the ground. So beautiful. I'll I'll also add really quickly that I think the second time we see it, when Jenny's throwing rocks at it, there's a sort of a sense of like she is confronting it for the first time too. Exactly. Yes, yes, all of this. One thing that doesn't work as well is uh, the hummingbird Mm. in... Benjamin Button, which is just so literalized and explained to us, but also in a way that doesn't really mean anything because the hummingbird means infinity, (laughs) but the movie's about death and how things end, which is not infinity. So it's about love that lasts for infinity. Maybe the hummingbird should have also died at the end I, in, in the I hurricane. Think so, like what? <laughs> Not to be extra bleak, but maybe that should have been the final shot. That the hummingbird gets like smashed against the window and dies. <laughs> First of all, a symbol that is added in that doesn't belong in a story that doesn't naturally occur in a story. The house where someone grew up is a symbol that is very well integrated into everyone's life. It's a symbol that we understand. It comes from the history of literature and cinema. It's not layered on top like a hummingbird that comes out of nowhere and is out at sea. 
and you have to add a line to explain. It was weird that that hummingbird was out at sea that far and its wings mean infinity. We have to explain that to you too. And then here it is in a hurricane at the end. Um, it's not an organic symbol. It's not a symbol that ends up meaning very much because it's not deeply personal to any of the characters and isn't actually sort of thematically that resonant. It's actually more thematically muddy. So not that there aren't working symbols in Benjamin Button. There are. There are some really beautiful symbols in Benjamin yeah. Button that do right. work. But the hummingbird, I don't think is one of them. I'm sorry to say. I agree. It's also one of these weird things where hummingbird in real life has a deeper sim symbolism. It's it's sort of representing joy and like the Aztecs believed it was like the messenger from, uh, from your ancestors coming back and stuff. But the movie doesn't explain it that way. And two, no movie should expect that you know just like some symbolism that a deeper thing ha has. I happen to, to know that for reasons, but like nobody knows that. Like, why would anybody know that? You know, so it's <laughs> like, right. don't put stuff in your movie and then explain it, but also expect people to know more about it than is explained. Yeah. As opposed to the house, which needs no other context than what is in the, uh, in the text itself. Yeah, Precisely. Unless it's like a, an ongoing theme from, you know, literature, like where we all understand what the color red means or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. The The hummingbird, I forget that it's in the movie every time I watch it. Mm. And it feels the most like, I don't think they knew what to do with this. So they just, they did it, but I don't think they felt confident. It's kind of like the rat showing up at the end of The Departed. like <laughs> Which we just talked about. <sighs> it's Brian's favorite part. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> See, look, CGI animals that just show up right at the end of a movie to try to act like it's deep. That wasn't CG. The rat wasn't CG, to be fair. It, wow. <laughs> the background is fake, though. Anyway. Yeah, so, I was yeah. going to say. <laughs> is there like a TV tropes page for that? For just like the symbolic animal it enters the, like, the final shot? Yeah. <laughs> there should be. Probably. Yeah. Yes. The other thing that both of you guys are talking about that I just want to kind of like highlight is that it, it's, you're also talking about how they're using filmmaking to help tell the story. And so there are the, like these visual symbols. And like you're saying, Brian, there's like, a line gets said out loud and that paired with the visual lets us connect all the dots. And so there's just a lot of like clever filmmaking happening, I think, mm -hmm. in both of these movies that make them fun to watch just on a movie level. And for the record, I think that the feather is a less effective symbol in Forrest Gump. Sure. I don't it's not like I think that everything in Forrest Gump is a perfectly effective symbol. I think sure. the feather is pretty clunky and almost on the level of the hummingbird. Yeah. But Jenny's house is 100%. Maybe it's a feather from the hummingbird. It's all <laughs> it's all circular. A giant white hummingbird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. My lesson really quick is, is kind of more just about the kinds of stories that I want there to be more of. And mm. Trisha, you mentioned early on, I believe, like, yeah, that these are fables. And I like movies that are that. And, and like the framing stories that we've talked about help signal to you this thing that I've spoken about before that I like in films where the movie's just going to tell you, we're going to tell you a story. This is a movie turn on imagination fun lens. Like we're not going to try to make this like a gritty, real like portrayal of things. Curious Case of Benjamin Button kind of goes there, ends up there a couple times, admittedly. I like these kinds of stories. I want there to be more about them. And what I appreciate about both of them, and I guess why I keep kind of mentioning the, the biopic or like you said, uh, Trisha, this kind of cradle to the grave story is that I like that both of these movies are about life and death. Like it's mm -hmm. not just like they happen to be about the story of someone's life, but like death and what you do with your life are deeply woven into the stories and the narrative and the text. And as we talked about really explicitly in, in Curious Case of Benjamin Button, I like that we have both of these movies because I think they're very obviously very different approaches to it. The Fincher Curious Case of Benjamin Button is a bit more detached and you know people have called his films cold and I totally get that. I think for me in this case it leaves room for me to enter the world of the story because I don't feel like the emotion is being pushed upon me. Mm. But also Forrest Gump is great because as you were talking about the score and all the filmmaking, like it pushes you into the emotion and makes you feel all those things. So I think it's really cool to have two examples of this weird kind of fable story that as we've just been talking about also uses filmmaking and all the different ways that you can to tell a story. So these are both really interesting movies to study and I want there to be more like these. 
And that's my life lesson for the world. <laughs> Benjamin Button is really beautiful, though, too. Mm. Like, just to say that, it looks incredibly gorgeous. Yeah. And that shot of Tilda Swinton that you talked about is exactly the one that I immediately thought of. But lots of other shots in here where Kate Blanchard is up in the gazebo and she's like dancing mm -hmm. in the gazebo. And like, it's just, it's very Fitzgerald, right? Yeah. It's like romantic. Uh, mm -hmm. filmmaking and Benjamin Button is really beautiful in that way. Is there always a Daisy in Fitzgerald? <laughs> yeah. Look, he got hung up yeah. a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Patrick, what lessons are you going to take away from these movies? Okay. Well, first of all, one thing that I, I do just want to say, if you guys are coining the, uh, the cradle to the grave. I certainly did not coin that, by the way. That's uh, from screenwriting biopic lingo. Okay, okay. But yeah. um, I think you should do an episode on cradle to the grave movies. Ah. Uh. Uh. But also compared with the uh, the Jet Li DMX movie, Cradle to Cradle the Grave. Cradle to the Grave. <laughs> right, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think <laughs> I, I, that would be a great episode. I'd love to listen to it. Yeah, Sweet. a good lens through which to explore. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. What can yeah. we learn yeah. comparing this gently DMX movie <laughs> to Forrest Gump? But no, okay. Uh, in terms of lessons, so this I don't know how much of a lesson this is, but it's something that I it, it's I mean it's it's a technique I was struck by that I'd forgotten about. There's a scene in Benjamin Button where I believe Daisy has first returned to New Orleans, and she and 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 Forrest go. Well, not Forrest. She and Benjamin. <laughs> <laughs> These unusual Southern men. Right. <laughs> but she and Benjamin go out for dinner. This is, and it, it, it's right before um, the like gazebo scene where she's mm -hmm. doing ballet surrounded by mist and it looks amazing. But I'm really curious if this was a directorial choice or if this was written into the script because I think either one, I'd believe. So they go to a restaurant to have dinner and in this scene, you hear the audio of them having this whole conversation. But visually, we just see, and it's all like from Benjamin's perspective, just him like looking at her walk. It's like, you know, the conversation is happening, but it's just lingering on him just sort of like taking in her, like being there with him, being back in his life for the first time. And it's so plants this scene in his perspective and like makes mm -hmm. them and makes like what he's feeling so much more important than what they than what they're talking about mm -hmm. the movie doesn't do that at any other point and also for a movie that's often kind of detached from benjamin just kind of like observing what he's doing like reading from his diary i'm not sure there's another scene that puts you in his head as much as this one and i thought that it's, it's such a simple technique and i thought like and that i immediately i like sat up as this was happening, I was like, mm. oh, okay, this is, this is good. This is, I'm, I'm, I'm into mm -hmm. this. And also, I don't know if, because I could see Eric Roth ju just writing like VO after each line, just saying like, we just, we stay in Benjamin's perspective, just watching her and like taking in her beauty. And uh, I thought it was good. So there's a lesson. Uh, that's a good technique. Watch that scene. Mm -hmm. Effective scene. I want to know now, yeah, if it was in the script. Occasionally, I feel like Fincher maybe doesn't know or doesn't want to deal with huge blocks of text. Because as you were mm. talking, I'm also thinking about like Social Network, where Mark Zuckerberg is taken out to the club by Justin Timberlake. Mm -hmm. And it's like a big, long Aaron Sorkin talkie scene. And so Fincher sets it in the loudest possible nightclub where you can barely hear the dialogue. Mm -hmm. That seems like the greatest sound mixing I've ever heard. Uh -huh. Right? It's close. great. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I, I feel like sometimes Fincher just like, it's like, there's a lot of talking. I don't know how much of this detail is actually useful. So like, let's do something like crazy with it. Yeah. So I could also see that big part of it. But as, regardless, it's really effective. I like mm -hmm. that. Awesome. What have you guys been watching? Trisha, what have you been watching recently? I watched this movie back around. Oh, yeah. Which was from 20. Yeah. Have you seen it, Brian? Yeah. Oh, man, I really enjoyed it. It's from 2019. It's a Brazilian film by a wonderful Brazilian filmmaker uh, whose name is in the show notes. I really liked this movie. It is a very slow burn. It is a movie that is about something that is incredibly obscure until at least halfway through the film. And it equally obscures 
its own genre in a way that I, I found really interesting where for the first, you know, no one told me anything about it. So I'm going to try to avoid telling you guys too much about mm-hmm. it as well. But for the first like hour of the movie, it kind of has a bunch of different genres simmering in it where it sort of has this ominous quality to it. Yet it feels sort of like a, a, a fairly straightforward drama potentially. And it has sort of like Western elements to it. And and all of these things are kind of mixed in there and just sort of simmering. And then as it hits the midpoint, it starts to really ramp up and gets really interesting and wild by the end. So I really, really liked it. It's a a surprising and very cool movie from this filmmaker. I'm very interested to see more from him. So strongly recommend Baccarat. Uh, It's streamable on a number of platforms. You can just rent it. Yeah. And and as Trisha said, just go in without really knowing don't anything look it up. Yeah. and and also Do don't expect at any point that you know what the movie is <laughs> like because no. it sort of feels like a movie where you're like okay i kind of get it and then the movie's like no but you, you do not yeah. yeah exactly you do not so also udo kier is in it who is always in insane movies mm-hmm. cool brian what have you been watching uh well as i mentioned before um i am re-watching all of the coen brothers movies in order uh, in, in true uh-huh. patrick willems fashion um, all, all I need is a, a case of wine. So my, the most recent is the sort of the trilogy in between Oh Brother and No Country for Old Men, where they sort of didn't have anything huge, but it was The Man Who Wasn't There, Intolerable Cruelty, and Lady Killers. Man Who Wasn't There, I, I've seen the most of these three movies, uh, but I hadn't seen it in a while. And it was just really fun to revisit it. It's just this weird but entertaining noir film with Billy Bob Thornton and James Gandolfini and Francis McDormand and like a 16 year old Scarlett Johansson and it is one of their most just stylized like if we talk about a fable or something like that is one of their most just like we're just putting it all out there and and have fun uh, it's actually based on The Stranger uh, the the novel that I love and have also tried to to write an adaptation of and uh, yeah, I just I recommend that one if you haven't seen it. It's not perfect, but it's just it's a it's really interesting and it's it's really solid and it's really watchable. I think is the important thing. A movie I had not seen in a long time and had not seen it as much is Intolerable Cruelty, which I was like, this is so damn good. <laughs> yes, I love Intolerable Cruelty. Yeah, I saw it in the theater and I liked it and I watched it maybe once afterwards, but like within the year that it came out or something, so I hadn't seen it in a long time. And I think it was a weird movie when it came out because it was kind of like we're saying with Benjamin Button, where it's like you don't quite get a Fincher movie. You don't quite get a, you know, it's like you don't quite get. It's a rom-com. You're like, what are you doing, Coens? (laughs) If you're going to like see a George Clooney, Catherine Zeta-Jones rom-com, you're going to feel like what the hell is happening? (laughs) Yes. And if you're going for a traditional Coen Brothers movie, you're still going to get kind of not that, you know. So with time and rewatching it, I was just like, man, this is so much fun. And Mm -hmm. and it's like really smart. And there's one scene that I remember my friend and I laughed out loud so hard in the theater. And that is still a a genius, gorgeous moment, which I will not. um, Is it the one with Wheezy Joe? Yes, it is. (laughs) (laughs) It is amazing. My friend Andy and I, I'd like literally texted him. I haven't talked to him in two years. And I was like, I just watched that scene. (laughs) Wheezy Joe. Yeah. Perfect. And uh, and Lady Killers is fine. Uh, mm-hmm. It's yeah, it's not one of their best, but it's a fun time. Tom <laughs> Hanks is great. Uh, speaking of Tom Hanks, Irma Irma P. Hall, Mama Collateral Mama, uh, mm-hmm. is is great mm-hmm. in it, and you know J.K. Simmons. Uh, like, uh, there's yeah, it's just a, a really fun cast. I would say don't rush out and see Lady Killers if you have not seen it and have also not seen some other Coen Brothers movies. Go watch them first. But yeah, it is a it is a perfectly fine <laughs> Coen Brothers movie. Nice, nice. Okay. But we've gotten the latest report yep. on the journey. <laughs> Probably the last report because I feel like most of the rest we've like already talked about and stuff. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. So I wasn't planning on talking about a video game, but I became obsessed with a video game recently that I just want to... It's a unique video game and I think it should be talked about more. I'm a little bit late to the party, but it's a game called Frostpunk published by 11-Bit Studios. Alex told me about it. Our producer Vince told me about it and it was recently available for free on the Epic Store. So I bought it or bought it for free and started playing it. And (laughs) it's it's like a city building survival game. 
And so like if you're into like civilization or like SimCity, it has a lot of the things that you want in a game. It's very well balanced. But what I was struck by is the story setting of it, where it's kind of as if Snowpiercer, right? The movie where they're on a train and the world Mm. is frozen over. It's basically that, but you're building a city. And so there's a, a singular generator and your job is to keep your people warm but you also have to keep your people fed but you also have to keep them housed and provide medical equipment but you need to be gathering resources while you're doing it and so the story context makes it really compelling where like you can enable different laws so sometimes you need children to go gather coal and so you have to pass a law that's like child labor sorry that's what we're doing but it makes you feel the weight of those decisions oh my god the balance of the mechanics does the thing that i love about a lot of video games, which is gives you this perspective that we don't often take, which is like a bigger picture sociological viewing the world as systems and people as resources and even like human happiness and like hope and discontent are resources that you have to manage. And I think it's a useful framework to dip your toe into a little bit occasionally just to like, this is also how things work on a big picture scale zoom out of your head and like look at how weird the world is so it's really fun game and i also really like the perspective that it it puts me in so frostpunk highly recommend (laughs) wow yeah awesome patrick what have you been watching recently great question this actually i I had to think about this for a second because i in normal times i feel like i i maybe watch like a movie a day and uh i've been (laughs) i've been so busy working on a, a project that uh I'm I'm not watching as many movies as I would l- like to. So I I, I realize the main thing that I I've been watching is uh in my spare moments I've been catching up on the TV show for all mankind on Apple TV Plus, which uh, I don't know if anyone here has watched it. No, I really want to though. Uh it's really good. I have one episode nice. left. Um, I there's two two seasons. The second season ended, I don't know, like a a couple months ago, I think. And I have one episode left. I've been maybe tomorrow's the day that I watch it if I have like an hour free. I was I was talking to a friend recently who had just started watching it and didn't know the premise going in. I knew the premise going in, and he was so excited by like the opening ten minutes of the show, which revealed what the the premise is. That I I realized like oh, that I I. I, I thought everyone knew this. It sounds amazing to watch it that way. So I for anyone listening, I will not actually spoil the the hook of the show. Um just check it out. If if you're not hooked 10 minutes in, uh then maybe just stop there because I, <laughs> I I can't but I also can't imagine not being hooked by it. But the the very the non-spoiler premise is it's basically like you know, it starts in in, in the nineteen sixties. It's it's about the US space program. But it's basically the it's sort of set in an in an alternate reality where the space race didn't end because normally like you know they kind of like we got we got to the moon and then things kind of like petered off a little bit from there it's like great we did it we did it we got to the moon <laughs> cool let's stop funding NASA as much like the second season is set in the, the like the mid eighties like they jump through time mm-hmm. very very quickly mm-hmm. uh, and the ripple effects of everything go out and start affecting like like politics and technology and society and all of these things within the country and the world. Hey, uh, you know, even even uh, Forrest Gump's best friend, John Lennon, uh, you know, shows up in, in, in the show, <laughs> not played by an actor like on TV. It's like a fascinating sort of like sociological thing, just seeing the way they build this alternate history. But it's it's also just like a, a really like in the way that like Apollo 13 is exciting are the in the way mm-hmm. that you know, the right stuff, you know, is great. I mean, it is a, a, a show about about the space program and about NASA and these astronauts and test pilots and all these things. And there's like some characters are real historical figures. And then a bunch are just like these great, wonderful, like new characters created for the show. And as the second season has been going on, it has become incredibly suspenseful. And uh, and it is it, it's genuinely one of my, my favorite shows of the past few years. Nice. And yeah, I, I would highly recommend it to anyone who likes space stuff. Nice. That's really exciting because I like space stuff. And yeah, I've been wanting a, a show. So I'm going to check that out. It's definitely worthwhile. 
you mentioned that you're like really busy or something. Are you like working on any kind of uh, <laughs> massive, <laughs> massive project? Finale anything you to anything? tell us about? Yes, I'm working on a really strange. An, an inc- what I've realized is an incredibly strange project that uh, is very hard to also explain to people who are or don't already know what this. <laughs> so somehow, I uh, I spent the last like year and a half of my nonfiction YouTube video essays threading in a very dumb uh, serialized <laughs> narrative throughout the whole thing. And somehow, and, and again, this thing, it, it, the, the narrative involves myself as myself, and then several of like my just friends from high school playing themselves. <laughs> uh, and I guess we we tricked enough people into kind of caring about it that we were able to like, you know, get like a budget and resources to just make like a mini movie that is the season finale of all <laughs> yes. of this. And uh, cause we've been treating it like a season of television. And, and so, yeah, so uh, I've had a nice, on the one hand, it's a nice break from writing essays, uh, which I really kind of needed. I was like on the brink of burning out there. Uh, and mm-hmm. we've just been basically making a movie for a little while and it'll, you know, That's hopefully amazing. we'll we'll wrap it and maybe at this point I don't even want to say anything about like when it'll come out because I'm I'm very bad at gauging these things. <laughs> sure. It's going great so far. It's very very silly. Um, we're putting everything we've we, we we've got into this. Uh, every every wacky idea. I am uh, working very hard on it and I'm very stressed out all the time. Um, <laughs> but it's um it's been fun. It's it's really been fun and and it is kind of like the culmination of this thing we've been working on for a long time and um and i'm i'm really excited about it i i think i think it'll be cool awesome i'm yes i'm also really excited about it i think that's just it's so fun that you are getting to do this and like i totally feel you about you know sometimes you need a break and to just do creative like tell a story stuff and it's so cool that this is just 100% that where is it going to premiere like where can people follow you and where can they find it when it's when it's done yes this will premiere on on the streaming platform nebula you know which we you know like have our affiliations with and uh we've talked about them a lot of of course (laughs) and i I will say i know some people complain like oh i have signed up for another streaming service it's three dollars a month it is less (laughs) than a cup of coffee to watch a movie that i think might be like an hour long it's like, it's really not a big ask. <laughs> While also getting access to exclusive content from like a bunch of the other best like yes. creators on the internet. Like, yeah. Exactly, exactly. There Seems are fair. there are many reasons to sign up for it, but it's going to be on Nebula. And uh, yeah, it will premiere there uh, in, in beautiful, pristine 4K in, in, uh, looking much better than, than YouTube. It doesn't have YouTube's annoying compression that mm, makes right. videos look worse than they mm-hmm. really are. But yeah, and then uh, but in the meantime, you can watch all of my my stuff on Nebula or or on YouTube for free, no paywall, and follow me on the social media platforms at Patrick H. Willems. Cool. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for taking time to continue this conversation about Benjamin Button <laughs> and Forrest Gump. It's a fascinating <laughs> conversation. It's led us to so many places. I'm sure it could lead us to more, but I feel very very satisfied now and I'm ready to move on to new things but I'm glad we got to spend this time together talking about these movies. <laughs> me too. Thank you so much for having me and giving me an opportunity to finally dig into this weird <laughs> issue. Always a pleasure. This has been our conversation about Forrest Gump and the curious case of Benjamin Button. We want to say a big thank you as always to all of the patrons that make this show possible. I want to say thank you to our producer Vince Major and our editor Eric Schneider. I'm Michael Tucker. I've been joined today by Trisha Rand, Brian Fittner, and Patrick Willems. All of our Twitter handles are in the show notes. Send us a tweet and say hi and we will see you in the next episode. Bye everybody. Bye bye. <laughs>